city which needn't be mentioned. On a street with no name, there is a house without a number. my house. If it was hard to find, that's because if it weren't, the authorities would find it too and arrange to have me moved. It seems they don't believe there is any such thing as a retired spy. There isn't either, you know. Ah, but I haven't introduced myself. I'm uh, Alexander Seriotis. Or if you prefer, Edward Smith Kenyon. Fortunato Mirinda. Bent Nordau. Oh, there are a lot of them. Perhaps you'd better just think of me as uh, Anton. Nationality? Since I am a professional neutral, let's make it Swiss. It's not important anyway, since we're not going to discuss me, but rather an attractive young lady. The beautiful woman spy has become so much of a part of fiction that we're apt to forget that she ever really existed. The story of one who did is contained are prepared for the Imperial German General Staff. At least it was secret. It's an almost incredible but documented fact that this woman's activities materially affected the outcome of the First World War and inadvertently helped create the menace of world communism. Her story started here, in 1914. Kaiser's army was hobnailing its way into France and Belgium. While its military back was turned, France's ally, Imperial Russia, retaliated by invading the isolated German province of East Prussia. Headquarters of the Tsar's Northwest Army Group was the city of Warsaw capital of what was then, as it is now, the unwilling province of Poland. And headquarters of many a Russian officer on bobtail furlough from the front was the Hotel Bristol, the notorious Hotel Bristol. these people. Your pardon, Excellency, for the inconvenience. Inconvenience, Captain. Impertinence. Remove your friends immediately and then report back to me with an explanation. Search the other room, Captain. And when does a hotel porter, a Polish porter, presume to give orders to a Russian officer? You brought these people here. Who are they? Captain, come out here. I told you to get out. Her clock. A repairman has come four times, yet it never runs. Do you know who I am? Of course. You are Lieutenant General Danilov. You command the Warsaw Military District. And you are an idiot. What? I said you are an idiot, which makes you a whit less criminal than your charming lady friend, who is a German spy. Order them to go away. And you are a lunatic. Who are you? The Okrana. The globe. A silver salt solution. Very useful for writing messages, General. Messages which are to be picked up regularly by a man who pretends to repair clocks. Of course, the Okrana must realize that this is a complete surprise to me. But you know this Bronska woman? Know her, yes. But I never talked to her. You. 
You were my friend. The notorious Hotel Bristol. Notorious because in early 1914, German spies were arrested there with greater regularity than its elevator service. Most of them were women, and their methods were too classic to escape detection, especially by this man, Sokolkov, the head porter who also happened to be an agent of the Okrana, the Tsar's dreaded secret police, and the first man shot by the Germans when they ultimately captured Warsaw. General Danilov was punished for his stupidity by being given a field command. The Baroness Vranska died on the gallows without ever knowing that she had been hired by the Germans for the express purpose of getting caught. And neither she nor the Russians ever knew that the patriotic woman who exposed her was herself a German spy. This was Maria Sorel. She ruthlessly betrayed a fellow agent so as to gain the trust and gratitude of the Tsar's secret police. Maria Sorel was not the glamorous super spy of popular fiction. Her job, however dangerous, was as prosaic as that of most real spies. She was what we call a rag picker, a gatherer of bits and pieces of information. Her methods were unique, certainly for the Hotel Bristol. While the sweethearts of various regiments were being detected by the Okrana and strung up like beads, Maria was getting away with being the big sister of the entire Northwest Army group. Misha! Hello, Maria. May we come in? Of course, but... but what a pleasant surprise! If you're taking me to the concert tonight, you're more than 12 hours early. But I suppose punctuality is a military virtue, isn't it, Lieutenant? Well, uh... Oh, I'm sorry, Maria. Uh, Mademoiselle Sorel? Oh, uh, Maria, if you're a friend of Misha. Uh, Lieutenant Verishensky. I am honored, Mademoiselle. Maria. Uh, your given name, it, uh, it isn't Lieutenant, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Georgie. Well, Georgie, won't you sit down? You too, Misha. Well, you aren't supposed to look sad until tonight after they play the Masordsky. Oh, that's just it, Maria. I won't be able to take you to the concert tonight. Is she prettier than I am? That's not it at all. My leave's been canceled. Oh, poor Misha. Just yours? The whole division. Petrov's picking up my kit and meeting me at the train. I've only got a few minutes. Maria, I hate to think of you alone in Warsaw, here in this hotel. I gave Georgie my ticket. Do you mind? He's an old friend from the university. Of course, Misha. Providing your leave isn't canceled during the Antrag. Oh, Georgie's stationed here. He's Army Headquarters or something, a corps. Anyway, it's shamefully bulletproof, so don't <laughs> admire him too much while I'm away. I admire you both. And you just take care of Marie until I can wangle a furlough and no longer. Well, come on. I thought you were going to see me off. I suppose I had better. We must make sure our hero really does leave. Maria. Marusha. Yes. Will you... Pray to St. George. Nothing's going to happen to you. The Germans will be across the Vistula in a week, and the war will be over, and you'll be back before the opera opens. I promise you. Of course. But in the meantime, I'll always be thinking of you. There are girls in Neidenburg. How will I know? We're not going into garrison. We're going into the line. But you'll know how I feel, because I'll always write to you, tell you. Will you, Misha? Every day. I'll be so lonely unless you do. Bits and pieces. A young lieutenant cancels a concert date, gives his ticket to a friend and promises to write. When German intelligence at Koblenz knows this, they will know more. They will know that the 3rd Guards Division, perhaps the whole 13th Corps, has been transferred from Samsonov's 2nd Army in the West to Rennenkamp's 1st Army in the East. For Misha Gildorf was not her only correspondent. There were at least eight others who thought they were violating no military security with their lower echelon chatter about their own square mile of combat zone. But the trivia from eight square miles put side by side can add up to an important fact about 20 linear miles of front line. Maria's job was to gather the trivia, memorize it, and then take a weekly shopping trip, like any Warsaw woman of fashion. Much is known about these shopping trips. They invariably took her over the river to the Praga district, to a small but exclusive millinery shop on the Ulitsa Schmielna. And like any woman, she always window shopped first.
Ah, mademoiselle, how nice to see you again. Thank you. I was just passing by. And you uh, saw something in our window? What was it? The La Boheme is amusing. But I don't like it in mahogany. Do you have it in tango? Ah, the tango. How fortunate that we still have it. Uh, oh, nothing uh, comes through from Paris nowadays with this tiresome war. What will happen to our modes? Oh, we pose our, our magnificent fighters and don't think me unpatriotic. But we are filthy milliners. Uh, do trimmers at the back. Speak low. What have you got? The mail was right this week. Something's been holding it up. Is it being intercepted? I don't think so. My captain from the Yushansky division complained that all his unit's mail was held up two weeks. What else? The 44th remount depot is on 24-hour duty. He's moved up to a small town with a 12th century church in a cafe called Beneckendorf House. I'd be Gregor Scheim. What else? One of my lieutenants makes a brave joke about his rations. For a week, the men have been eating boiled sheepdog. He signed his letter, Woof Woof. What unit? The Orenburg Cossack Regiment. Is that all? I'll take it. I hope you like it as much as it becomes you, mademoiselle. Bits and pieces. Trivia relayed orally from agent to agent until it reaches Koblenz, where it might signify that food and mail are not reaching the front, that transportation is overworked, that Russia's communication with the rear is broken down, or it might signify nothing. Maria's job was to gather information, not weigh it. Aha. Oh, that model in the window, the one with the Empress Roses. It was meant for you. I know. How long can you hold it for me? Such an urgent hat. Tuesday at the latest. Oh, I, I nearly forgot. The length of grow grain you ordered. Uh, here they are. Uh, yeah. Benham Kampf's here. Samsonov's grouping here. There are 60 miles between them. We must know what unit is going into the line Bischofsburg, Doc Kenham. The line Bischofsburg, Doc Kenham. An unknown sector between the Russian 1st Army and his 2nd. Across from it, the Germans 8th Army with a new commander. Resurrected from retirement by the general staff and ordered to save East Prussia was an elderly unknown, Paul von Hindenburg. Since Maria was ostensibly a highly respectable young lady, her methods had to be far more discreet than the other less ladylike Delilahs of the Hotel Bristol. The French officer in the lobby. The color of his collar tab indicated he was an artilleryman. Did his presence in Warsaw verify the rumors that the Russians were receiving batteries of the French rapid-firing 75-millimeter field guns? The parade of reserves threw Warsaw on their way to the front. Not much a patriotic woman could do but wave a flag, unless she was Maria Sorel. Then she could memorize the unit numbers on passing shoulder boards. She could notice that there were no transport trains below regiment and that the men carried rifles of three different calibers. But her assigned zone of operation was still the Hotel Bristol. It's just that you are quite the most civilized thing I've seen in Warsaw, Mademoiselle Sorel. I think it's just that you're homesick, French, naturally gallant, and had too much wine. And you have had almost none at all. Naturally, when wine goes to a woman's head, she can lose it. And her heart. They are the same thing. Then, by all means. Easy for a soldier to say. He is in Warsaw today, tomorrow. <laughs> Where? Where? Is Bischofsburg too far away? If it's on the front, it might as well be on the moon. Is it? On the front? Not yet. But it will be. And I'll never see you again. So? But if I promise faithfully that I'll come to Warsaw to see you very often. Leave the front? How could you? Well, I am here as an observer. I hide my own orders. I could make many excuses to journey to Warsaw. All I need is a reason. When will you be leaving Warsaw? Soon. Why is that important? So I can know how soon you'll be coming back. If I tell you, will you drink to it? Well, I shouldn't, but I will. Sure. 
empty. <laughs> no matter. Reinforcements have arrived. The wine you requested, monsieur? I have not asked for the bill. No, monsieur, but this is a military district and it is a rule. An officer receives the bill with a third bottle. Oh, but I have violated no security. I have been discreet. Have I said anything? No, you haven't said anything. had reconciled herself to collecting nothing but crumbs, she was suddenly handed a slice of the cake. Or sign you to a, a regiment of poles or something? <laughs> it could mean 50 strokes of the lash, but it would be worth it to have you to myself. <laughs> you didn't mind going to the cafe, did you? Of course not, Georgie. I was flattered. Marushka. Oh, I thought you'd add too much wine. You'd better go back and apologize to that polar bear of a general of yours, or he'll ruin my life and keep you at the office every night during the opera. I won't be able to take you to the opera much longer. Oh, Georgie, I've interfered with your duty and you're in trouble. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. You would say that to save my feelings. Believe me. Marushka, I... I cannot tell you how to hear Then perhaps you shouldn't tell me at all. You'll find out yourself in a week or so anyway. Marushka, we're moving out. Oh, Georgie, you too? I was afraid of that, so afraid. Are you saying what I hope you are? I don't know, Georgie. If you mean, do I love you? I, I don't know. But you might. In time, you might. Time? We have two weeks at least, maybe three. I realize that isn't much, but... No, George, it isn't much time. It wouldn't be fair to you. And, and Misha, who will I ever tell Misha? You won't have to tell him. I'll tell him. I'll see him in a few weeks, and I'll tell him myself. But how can you? You'll be miles apart. No, we'll be in the same area. I've seen the orders. He'll understand. Oh, Georgie, you mean you'll be fighting right next to each other? Well, on the map, yes. But I'll see him, I promise. Marushka, there's so much I haven't told you. That remark was a decided overstatement, since he had just told her the Russian plan of battle. Renenkampf and Samsonov were going to extend their flanks until they met and together sweep through East Prussia. But sentiment aside, when a certain millinery shop opened for business the next morning, Maria Sorel knew she'd better be there too. This was Tuesday, seven hats. The courier was ready to leave, but the sixth was black. That meant danger. And the seventh was trimmed with ostrich plumes. That meant shop closed until further notice under new management. We don't know if Sokolkov recognized Maria, and neither did she. She only knew that she had a piece of military information so vital that it had to be delivered immediately. And since her message drop was closed, she would have to deliver it herself. She had a choice of two routes. This way, all around the Baltic to Königsberg. Or this way, straight through the Russian lines. But through an area where it was almost as dangerous to be a woman as it would to be a spy. That was the way she decided to go. The only transportation northward to the front was quite naturally military. And the only way Maria could travel in that direction was by doing what all spies dread, putting on the enemy uniform. And where do you think you're going? I lost my regiment. Under the wagons? It must be a very small regiment. You wouldn't be running away from the Huns now, would you? I told you. Ah, uh, we've got another regiment just for fire eaters like you. Well, move. Move. Do you want the war to be over before you've had a chance to be slaughtered? Meet your new comrades, the white-livered hussars. Another straggler. He's got the face of a girl, but the heart of a lion. So give him the imperial suite. Up you go. Don't worry about German bullets. 
There are Russian bullets for any man who tries to get off this wagon without authority. <laughs> be the last one you'll see. Come on, come on. The Grand Duke can't attack without his fighting rabbits. Is that all there is? I'd better make sure we haven't any bashful ones. Nobody's here. Them off to war. Go on, you glory hunters. trails and hiding whenever she heard anyone approach. For two days, Maria headed straight for the sound of the guns. A straggler going toward the front was not apt to be hindered, but once there, the danger from both sides was enormous. World War I had not yet bogged down into well-defined trenches. The front lines were fluid, marked only by the ominous silence and the probing lances of mounted reconnaissance patrols and the smell of death. of August 1914, Maria Sorel delivered her message to Colonel von Hoffmann, Hindenburg's chief of staff. On the 26th of August, Hindenburg launched full force of his 8th Army against Samsonov's army and defeated it at the Battle of Tannenberg, before it could join with Rennenkamp's 1st Army. One of the most crushing defeats of the entire war, or any war. And strangely enough, neither Russia nor Germany ever recovered from it. For in order to win the battle, Hindenburg had to beg two badly needed corps from the Western Front. As a consequence, Germany lost the first battle of the Marne, which many experts say was the decisive battle of the war. Russia lost not only a battle at Tannenberg and its aftermath, the Missourian Lakes, but virtually all of her top flight officers, the cream of her military caste. 
When the revolution came in 1917, these were the men who might have stopped the Bolsheviks. But thanks to Maria Sorel, they were all dead. Maria Sorel? Well, in the fall of 1915, she was captured by the Russians, again in the Tsar's uniform. They didn't know for certain that she was a spy, but rather than take a chance, they hanged her anyway. I'll see you next week. That is, if they haven't caught me.